in our study of the Gospel of Mark, and we have this lesson and one more, and we're through with Mark. But at this particular point, we now come to the actual crucifixion of Jesus. And the events we're going to read about, they, they just they reveal a world turned upside down. Jesus is the king who dies an outlaw's death. He is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, who's rejected by the very people he came to deliver. He's the son of God, but he does not use his great power for himself. He seems to be powerless as he dies. All traditional meanings, all traditional understandings are now reversed at the cross. Think about that. Weakness becomes a sign of strength. Death becomes a means of life. God forsakenness means reconciliation with God. Those who executed Jesus, we find out, are actually fulfilling the will of God. His executioners thought his death was the end of him, but it actually is the end of their own religious order. What a topsy-turvy turn of events we're reading about here. So let's look at the text for today. It's Mark chapter 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 21 and go through verse 47, the end of the chapter. What a story. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, leme sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah And someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, putting it on a staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and Joseph, and Salome. And in Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. And then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. 
right before I started reading the verse right before that, chapter 15, verse 20 says, Then they led him out to crucify him. Normally, I understand the condemned person carried the crossbeam called the patibulum. They carried the crossbeam to the site of crucifixion. And there, after he was nailed to the crossbeam, it would be fastened to the vertical beam, the stipes, which was already and probably permanently in place. You have to have a, raise a question, though. Why, why didn't Jesus carry his own cross? Whether it's the whole thing or just the crossbeam, why doesn't he carry his own cross? And Mark doesn't tell us. Maybe he was too weak from the beating he had just received. Maybe he was just too slow to suit uh, the execution squad. Whatever the reason, the soldiers conscript an innocent bystander to carry the cross for Jesus. And I love what one commentator said. Really a great statement. He said, one of the profound paradoxes of Christianity is to be found in the fact that the one who is unable to carry his own cross is the one who enables us to carry ours. And whatever the reason for him not carrying that cross, he's the one, though, who gives us the strength to carry our own cross. Now, Mark is the only New Testament writer who tells us that Simon of Cyrene... Now, other writers mention him, but Mark is the only one who tells us that Simon had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting statement right there. That's an indication that Simon and his sons were well known in the early church. They had become followers of Jesus. In fact, in Romans 16, 13, Paul mentions a Rufus, may have been this son of Simon. I, I can't say that for sure, but Mark writes to the Roman church. And it's like he's saying, uh, Simon carried the cross. You know, you know, Rufus was his dad. There was, oh yeah, we know, that was his dad that did that, yeah. It, they were well known in the early church and were believers. Another interesting thing, these names, Simon, which is Hebrew, Alexander, which is Greek, and Rufus, which is Latin, hint at the universality of the gospel. This message of the cross is eventually going to reach across all cultures. It's going to reach and embrace people of all nations, whoever they are, Simon, Alexander, Rufus, whether you're Jew, Greek, Roman, it doesn't matter. The gospel is for you. That's, that's a hint at that. Now, this grim procession ends up at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. That name could refer to the shape of the hill or the crag. Some people think that. It could have been named such because it was the common location for executions. Again, we're not told. And Mark does not go into any great detail about the act of crucifixion itself. And he doesn't talk about the excruciating pain that crucified people endured. Oh, by the way, the word excruciating, do you know where it comes from? It's a Latin word which means out of the cross. The Romans when they wanted to describe the worst pain they could think about, thought of the cross, crucifixion, excruciating, out of the cross. And, and Mark, he doesn't say a whole lot about that. Jesus refuses wine and myrrh mixture that was offered. And here again, you can only guess why. We've often said, well, he wanted to be clear-headed in all this when he was dying. Maybe so, but we're not told why he refuses to drink the myrrh and the wine. Those who did the crucifying cast dice to see who would get his clothes. And we don't mention this very often, and certainly we never depict it in pictures, and, and rightly so. But Jesus was crucified naked. He didn't have a modest loincloth on, as we so often see that. And the reason I tell you that is, is because not only was crucifixion an act of brutality and cruelty and great pain, but it was an act that was designed to bring about total humiliation and degradation. And that's what it did to Jesus. Now the charge against him, it's a political charge. King of the Jews. He claims to be a king. He's crucified between two rebels. And I thought, how fitting. He spent his life among sinners. And it's only fitting that he would die between two sinners as he died for sinners. And then we read about the derision and the mockery that was spoken against him. People just passing by, the religious leaders, and even the two thieves heap abuse upon him. 
The mockers were told hurled insults at him. And here, the word insult is the Greek word blasphemo, blasphemy. It's the same word the high priest uses back in chapter 14, verse 64, when he speaks of Jesus. And he says, this man, you know, do we need any other evidence? This is blasphemy. Same word. So Mark, in using those words, I think is challenging the readers to make a decision. Who's the real blasphemer? This man who claims to be the son of God? Or these people, these, these mockers who go by heaping their blasphemy, their insults upon him? Make a decision, folks. Is it Jesus or is it the mockers who really speak blasphemy? And the mockery recalls the charges that were raised at the trial. Remember the false witnesses said that this man claimed he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? I I can just imagine seeing this feeble, exhausted figure hanging on a cross must have made that charge seem ridiculous and laughable. This guy, this guy's going to tear down the temple? This guy's going to rebuild it in three days? And I'm sure they just had a great laugh at that. But their mockery, unwittingly, testifies to a truth that was way beyond their ability to understand. See, the truth is, Jesus' death does destroy the temple made with hands. And his death builds a new temple not made with hands. And this new temple has no ties to any physical location. This new temple is a new community of people who believe that Jesus died for them and that God raised him from the dead. His death, folks, does away with the need of a physical temple. It does away with the need for temple ritual and temple sacrifices. So when he died, he indeed did destroy that temple that was standing in Jerusalem there. And he proclaims that God will build a temple without walls and he'll do it through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Then the chief priests and the teachers get into the fray and and, and so doing they unwittingly speak another great truth. It's amazing how people not knowing what they're saying are speaking truth. But these guys say he saved others but he can't save himself. How true. Now, first of all, they acknowledge that Jesus saved others. And all of us who have read Mark know that he saved others. We think of the disciples in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, and he saved them. We think of a woman with a hemorrhage of blood. We think of a demon-possessed boy. We think of a dead girl. And we say, yeah, he saved others. But the truth is, he cannot save himself. If Jesus had saved his own life by calling down legions of angels, as he said he could do in Matthew chapter 26, then he could not save others by his death on the cross. And so that statement, saved others, can't save himself, is absolutely true. But he willingly went to the cross to save us. Now from noon until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, darkness fell over the whole land And at about 3 o'clock, Jesus cries out in this loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that, that raises an interesting question to me. I mean, here he is in excruciating pain, right? Hanging on the cross. And you say, why would anybody quote scripture? Because that's Psalm 22, 1. Why would anybody quote scripture in that situation? Sounds strange to us, doesn't it? But it really isn't. I want you to remember that Jesus had lived and breathed the word of God all of his life. And it's only normal now that the scripture would be on his heart at a time when he really needs the strength of God. It's not unusual at all that he would speak the word at this time. And to me, this isn't a cry of despair. This isn't a cry of defeat or doubt. It's really one of victory. When you read all of the 22nd Psalm, yes, you find a lot of references to the crucifixion. You you, you read references to the mocking. You you read about how he's going to be pierced. You read about them dividing his clothes. So there are a lot of things that happened here. Psalm 22 speaks about them. But the Psalm ends in victory. It ends in triumph. 
In fact, I want you to listen to this statement near the end of the song. It's Psalm 22, 24. Listen carefully, thinking about what he says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now listen to what, how the psalm ends. For he, Yahweh, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of his afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And I believe that's what Jesus was looking toward, the victory. This is not a cry of helplessness. This isn't a cry of abandonment. I know what we've often said. Well, yeah, he was carrying all the sins of the world, and so God can't look on sin. And he turns his face away from Jesus, and Jesus says, God, why have you... I don't think that's what it is at all. Now, Jesus did take on our sins. I'm not doubting that. But I don't think that's what's happening here. I think he is, he is speaking these words from Psalm 22, looking to the victory that was to be his, looking to that promise that God has not despised his suffering one. He has not hidden his face from him. And the Lord, I think, in using that psalm, beginning that psalm, is looking forward to that. And then we're told that Jesus breathed his last. And at that very moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, that's the veil or the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place. This is the second and only other time in Mark where that word torn is used. It's very interesting to see the two usages. The first time is back in chapter 1. At Jesus' baptism, when he came up out of the water... Mark tells us that he saw heaven being torn open, heaven torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. That's chapter 1, verse 10. Now, the most holy place in the temple, that's a symbol of heaven, where God dwells. In fact, tradition has that the the, the veil itself, this thing that was torn, had depiction of, of heaven, stars and that kind of thing embroidered on it. But the most holy place is is a symbol of heaven. So what we have here is that that which was only accessible to God has now been opened for all believers. And it cannot be expressed any clearer than the way the writer of Hebrews does it in Hebrews chapter 10, 19 and 20. Listen to this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have... We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. There it is. This is so symbolic. He dies and we have access to God. We have access to heaven itself. Don't miss the significance of this. We don't have to wait on somebody else. We don't have to have a high priest who enters the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement to make sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the people. We don't have to wait on him or any other person. We have direct access to God because of the death of Christ. What a great truth that is. And then Mark records a most unusual event. The centurion. The man in charge of the execution squad noticed how Jesus died and he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some really interesting things there, folks. First of all, this soldier who had obviously witnessed many men die is impressed with how Jesus died. When he saw how Jesus died, he says this. That tells me that the Lord didn't die whimpering and begging for his life. He doesn't die in doubt. Oh, God, where are you? You've left. It's none of that. He dies with courage and he dies with the conviction that he is going to be victorious. And the centurion saw that and he said, there's something about this man. He is the son of God. Now, secondly, this centurion is a servant of the Roman emperor, right? And son of God was a title reserved for the emperor. And now this soldier bestows that title on a Jew who has just been executed. Wow, what an amazing thing. Mark is telling his readers that Caesar 
and all the values that his world is built on, Caesar is passing away. This is the Son of God, not the guy in Rome. This is the Son of God. And that other, it's all passing away. A new king is here, and he shows us that obedience, even unto death, is what can change the hearts of human beings. It's not violence. It's not raw military or political or economic power that can change people. This centurion is changed by the simple power of love and seeing obedience to God. There's a new king in town, folks. The old king, sorry, he's out. But there's a new king, the son of God. Now, the final part of our text tells of Jesus' burial. That's verses 42 through 47. Joseph of Arimathea, we've never heard of him before, but he comes forward to claim the body of Christ. He's the third exceptional character to emerge out of nowhere to do something for Jesus. Simon is the first one who carries the cross, Centurion's the second, and now Joseph of Arimathea. I I want you to know I'm not through with these guys either. Next week I want to talk about the women, I want to talk about Simon, I want to talk about the Centurion, and I want to talk about Joseph. But I just want you to think about this. They just come out of nowhere. I'll give you a little hint. The people who should have been helping Jesus don't. But out of nowhere come folks, wow, that help him. Look forward to that next week. But this Joseph, he's a brave man. To ask for the body of somebody who has just been executed for high treason is to put yourself at risk of earning the same fate. You know, Pilate could have said, why do you want this body? You going to go make a shrine? You going to make some memorial to this guy who we just executed? I I was just thinking about this this week when, when after World War II, a number of Nazi war criminals were executed. Do you know most of them were buried in secret places or they were cremated and their ashes thrown out in in the ocean because the Allies did not want Anybody to say, hey, here's where Heydrich Himmler's buried. Let's make a little shrine here. Or here's where, of course, Hitler, that was a little different thing. But you can see what Pilate might have done. He said, well, I'm not giving you that body. You're going to go make some shrine out of it. No, he, he doesn't do that. All Pilate is concerned with is to determine if Jesus really is dead, which he is. And so the governor surrenders the body to Joseph, who then places it in this cave-like tomb carved out of rock, And he rolls a huge stone over the entrance. And that ends the account of Jesus' death, so to speak. Mark's picture is bleak, but uh, it avoids sensationalism. Uh, He does not give a graphic detail of Jesus' agony. But he he does ask us to focus on the theology. He asks us to focus on the spiritual meaning of the cross. And I want to just briefly, a couple of minutes, mention some of the things we can learn. Number one... The cross reveals the truth about humanity. Uh, Think about the sins that we have talked about that put him on the cross. Pride, envy, jealousy, betrayal, greed, cruelty, indifference, cowardice, murder. And then add your own to that, okay? Add your own sins to that. The cross points out so graphically the truth about the human dilemma. We are immersed in sin, and we are guilty of all those things. So it reveals that. But the cross also reveals God's incredible love. I I keep being drawn back to the statement, he saved others, but he can't save himself. It was love that drove him to the cross. It was love that kept him there. Love that made him offer himself to solve our human dilemma. The cross also reveals that things are never like they really seem in our world. And I I think that's an important lesson for all of us to learn because we're we're, we're so immersed in the things of this world. They're never what they seem, folks. They're never what the news portrays. Don't you know that? Up to this point in the story. And imagine that you're reading the story for the first time. You've never heard it. You're a Roman, and you've never heard this, and, and you get this manuscript and you start reading it, and you read up to this point, it would seem that the high priests have won. Jesus is dead. He's buried. A riot has been avoided. Roman wrath has been averted. But the truth is, he isn't going to stay dead, and he isn't going to stay buried. 
And the powers that be could not stop the power of God unleashed by the resurrection. And the very thing they feared is going to happen in just a few years. There's going to be Roman retribution. There's going to be Roman wrath against them. And uh, so things are just not like they seem. The cross tells us that. And then finally, the cross reveals that God's love and his power can win over those that we would never dream of responding to the gospel. The centurion is a great example of that. Who would ever imagine that this battle-hardened soldier would recognize who Jesus is? But that's because of love, and that's because of obedience. And, and, and we often become so negative in our outlook, and we think not, nothing's going to change this world. Nothing can change greedy, immoral, power-hungry, violent people. I'm telling you, the gospel has the power to change lives. The cross has the power to truly change the most unlikely people of all. That drug dealer, that tyrant who rules another country, that terrorist over here, this hardened businessman who just steps on everybody. Nothing can change them. Yes, there is a power that can change them, and it's the power of the cross. And so we're taught those lessons as we look at the crucifixion.